It's great to see everyone this morning. I wanted to bring you up uh, to speak just a little bit on some of the progress regarding our expansion and construction. Uh, you probably noticed there's been some grading and rolling uh, in the expanded parking lot. We're hoping to have that paved very soon. You probably also noticed some framing to what will be the new main entrance when you came in this morning. And there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that's going on, engineering related to uh, uh, heating, air conditioning, electric, uh, some decisions that are being made about windows, doors, all that stuff. So the process continues to move uh, forward. And uh, right now we're on a schedule that allows us to make sure we're all enclosed uh, before the snow flies. I'm sorry I had to say that four letter word, snow, but uh, it, it's something that we're trying to, to work to stay ahead of. So appreciate your prayers for that. This morning we're starting a new series called More or Less, More or Less. And we are going to be in Luke, the 18th chapter, very uh, familiar, if, if you know even just very little about Scripture, you've probably heard about this interaction Jesus had with someone who was three things all of us wish we were. And it starts out by saying, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And when he heard this, he became, what's the next two words? Very sad. Because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? And Jesus replied, what is impossible with men is possible with God. So I think there are things we wish we had more of. I also think there are things we wish we had less of, less, less stress, less, less problems, less grief, less sorrow, uh, less weight, <laughs> literally sometimes. Um, and sometimes when something is missing, we react rather strongly to that. In fact, if you're a parent of a small child, anytime you're in a public space and you don't have line of sight to your child, it can elicit panic. I mean, you just, where are they? And, and your concern gets very elevated very quickly. Or uh, one of the things that, that bothers me a lot is if, if I can't find my wallet. Does that bother anybody besides me? Yeah, it bothers you if I can't find my wallet, too. I, mean, I just, if I can't find my wallet, and as the kids get older, if I can't see my kids and can't find my wallet at the same time, I know nothing good is coming out of that. So the idea is uh, there are things that we wish we had more of. There are things we wish we had less of. And I'm going to talk about material things. And I have to tell you, this is one of those things that people just expect pastors to weigh in on in a certain way. So I'm going to acknowledge something to you this morning is that when it comes to material things, religion tends to focus on guilt. Um, there's a lot of guilt that can go along with things that we have. And, and guilt can actually disable our ability to enjoy something that we actually possess. Sometimes that guilt can be appropriate. If, if we obtain something in an inappropriate way, uh, we should feel something about that that's not good. But sometimes we worked, we, we got it in honorable ways, and we still are unable to enjoy it just because there are other people who don't have the same thing. And we have a difficult time managing guilt, and then usually when religious leaders weigh in on material things, you hear a lot about greed. And we can have an insatiable desire just for more of everything. Nothing ever seems to be enough. And what we should know is that when Jesus talks about material things, he doesn't operate with the currency of guilt. 
He insists on speaking truth, so he doesn't hide or pretend about actions or attitudes that we struggle with, because he understands that focusing on them is not intended to put us down, but to set us free. So he doesn't run away from it, but he doesn't use it against us. He also doesn't lead us into a wilderness of greed either. And by the way, in religious world, greed does look a little different. We all know that greed is not good, and we have a hard time acknowledging that we're greedy in spiritual circles. So we, we do it a little bit different. It looks a little bit different. It looks a little bit more like entitlement. The idea is this. If I live a good life, then I should have, and whatever that is, and what we're really doing is trying to use the, the rule system of spiritual life to get what we really want, which is usually something other than God. And Jesus doesn't take us down that road either. Now, the general rule is, if one is good, then two is better. Let's just try that. I'll, I'll, say, I'll say the first thing. One is good, and two is right. So if you have one dollar, that is. If you have two dollars, that is. Exactly right. If you have one car, that is. Yeah, if you have two cars, that is. Exactly right. If you have one kid, that is. Yeah, you weren't so sure on that. <laughs> if you have two kids, that is. There you go. One vacation is. Two vacations are. That's right. One home is. Two homes are. One spouse is, wait a minute. <laughs> the correct answer is enough. <laughs> More of something is not always better. There are lots of things that we actually want less of. And there are some things that we think we want more, but when we get it, it doesn't work out the way we want. Do you know, some of the best lessons we ever learn in our lives are when we have less, not more. It, they're not easy lessons, but they serve us really well the rest of our lives. Now, in religious environments, guilt can be used to try to get people to give something that they're hanging on to. And I think that is a really unhealthy motive. I don't think it honors God, and I don't think it helps anyone. People handle guilt in funny ways. In fact, there was a preschool. They came up with a clever idea. A preschool who they had a few parents that were stopping by a little bit too late to pick up their kids. And, of course, that messes up the schedules for people who are working at the preschool. So they came up with an idea. Any parent that was late to pick up their child at the preschool would have to pay a fine of $6. And so they imposed the fine. And the percentage of parents who were picking their children up late doubled. I know. I'm surprised, too, right? You would think, why would they do that? And they found out the answer because they could absolve their guilt for $6. And that's a bargain. And, so they, and by the way, they decided to scrap the whole system and eliminate the fines and go back to plan A. And they never were able to get that percentage of parents back down to where it originally was. Uh, when we try to use stuff to deal with guilt, we unleash a lot of other things in our lives that are not healthy. So. Uh, the person that we're looking at in Scripture today is three things everybody wants to be. The first is he is rich. He's got more than he needs. He's got more than most people. So that's a desirable thing in our culture. Secondly, he's young, though it's not obvious in the passage that we read. It doesn't say he's young in Luke 18, but this passage of Scripture, this story is told in Matthew 19 and in Mark 10. And in Matthew 19, it actually says at one point, Jesus said to the young man, so we know that he's young. I mean, who doesn't want to be younger? You know, just at least look younger. And then he's a ruler. He has authority. He has a position. He's not limited to complaining and rants. He actually has a way to make a difference in real life. But he felt that something was missing. It wasn't a feeling that he could ignore. His soul was telling him something important. And he comes to Jesus to find the answer. And Jesus identifies the one thing this guy lacked. And it's not what he wanted to hear. He said he was very sad. 
I think one of the things we have to make a decision in our faith journey is will we only listen to God when he says something we like or agree with? In our culture, I actually think there's more interest in spirituality and God than I've seen in my lifetime. But I will also tell you that there's a lot of people who are willing to check the box and eliminate the possibility of God, or at least the Christian version of it, just simply because God has said or done something they don't like. That the rules of determining how we're going to decide our eternity are actually based on our opinion. That's a really unhealthy way to think. And so we have to decide that. Now, we all have stuff, so the answer is, why do we have stuff? And, and, and the first thing is, uh, we acquire some things just because they're useful. They help us accomplish more. They help us improve our skills. They help us better connect with other people. They, they help life be a little bit more manageable. I can remember my, my grandfather, uh, none of you will ever remember this, but way back in the day, they used to have lawnmowers that had no motors. <laughs> Does anybody remember such a thing? Oh, my goodness. Yes. And, and, and he would go out there, and, and you had to push it and then back it up and push it and back it up, and it would take him two days to mow the lawn. And I am so grateful that we've got better options today, aren't you? Like, that's useful. Sometimes we just acquire things because it actually helps our life work better can free up more time for more important things. And sometimes we acquire things because they're beautiful. Humans are attracted to beauty. We have a hard time ignoring it. We'll go a long way to see it, and we'll stop when we notice it. And sometimes we can feel a little guilty for having something beautiful that we own, but our soul seems to crave beauty. It seems to need beauty. Sunsets, pictures, paintings, sculptures, music. We seem to need this in our life. We've been created for far more than just neat and orderly. We need beauty. If you have even a single room in your home that is beautiful, you'll notice that when you are in it, you feel a little more inspired and a little more calm. It's telling us about how we're created. So, we can, we can obtain things because they're useful. We can obtain things because they're beautiful. But there's a third reason that winds up being some, a really big reason for why we obtain more things. And that is because we think it'll make us feel more valuable. If I have that, people's opinion of me will be better or I will feel better about myself. And we hope if we make that purchase, it'll make a difference. And there's two options to that, and both of them are bad. The first is it may seem to work. Like you get the thing that you are pretty sure is going to get you more friends or get you better status, and it seems to work. You get the attention you want. The doors seem to open. More people are interested. And, and here's what you need to know. That'll put you on an unbelievable treadmill that you have a really hard time getting off because now you have to keep getting the next thing and the newest thing and the best thing and the shiniest thing and the latest thing and the fastest thing and all of it just to, to keep your value where you wish it was. And then there are people it seems to not work at all. You assume if I get that, then people will want me around more and you get it and you don't get the response you were looking at. And you would think that people would look at that option and go, well, that's a faulty premise. I shouldn't do that anymore. But that's not what happens. We assume we didn't buy something good enough, expensive enough, or new enough. We just need to sacrifice more. If I had more, then I'll have more friends. And it's, it's a trap very hard to get out of. We're constantly exposed in our culture to messages that tell us if you are not happy with where you are in your life right now, it's because there's something you do not own. And if you had that, then your life will be fulfilled. Jesus tells us something completely different. If you're not satisfied with what you have, you're not going to be satisfied with what you get. It's just how it works. 
Then there's the problem, what if the stuff that we have is actually contributing to our growing sense of stress and dissatisfaction? I mean, money can actually cause problems. I know some of us are here this morning and say, I'd like that set of problems for a change. Just once, please. But money can magnify our problems. You know, if you don't have enough money, you will be tempted to steal. But if you have more than enough money, you will be more tempted to lie. Someone will come along and, and they'll, they'll want to ask something from us, and, and we will come up with responses that are not true to get us off the hook. We will say things about what we own that are not exactly accurate. An abundance of money can diminish your resolve to be generous. They've done studies. The more money you make, the less percentage you give away. If you are a billionaire, you give less percentage than someone who makes, as a rule, than someone who makes minimum wage. It's a fascinating thing. So what, what happens? What drives this? An abundance of money can actually also make us feel more prepared for life. If I have lots of money, then if I lose my job or if something happens, I'll be prepared. Money can prepare you for some things, but it doesn't prepare you for lots of things. Money can't prepare you for that health situation that's going to shorten your days or significantly reduce the way you live your life. Money doesn't really make a difference when it comes to acts of betrayal against you or the death of someone that you love. Money doesn't prepare you for those things. Faith prepares you for those things. Money won't do it. So what I want to kind of drive home today is that our purpose can't be found in what we purchase. We all seem to need a meaning in life. You'll hear people say this when they get really frustrated after trying really hard. They'll use this phrase, so what's the point? Why am I even bothering? And they're telling you they can't see meaning. And I wish I could tell you that if you bought something, the meaning shows up, but that's not how it works. You never, you never get something, and then all of a sudden your life makes sense. I mean... I've, I've, got a, I've got a smartphone, and I will tell you, it actually works. It makes me smarter. I'm very grateful for that. But when I got this, I did not look at it and go, oh, now I understand my life and my purpose, and that's not how it works. And yet, often we assume that it will. We cannot find our purpose in what we purchase, but it can be discovered in what we give. The most frequent stories I hear is when someone gives of their time or their energy or their gifting or their resources that they actually discover something of why they're here. Stuff starts making sense now. So choices to consider if you're going to consider purchasing something. By the way, let me just put in a little disclaimer right now. Okay. Uh, you might be sitting here and going, oh, I get it. They're in an expansion project, and this is the money message. And so what I want you to know is my heart is not at all to manipulate anyone to do anything. And our offering is actually at the end of the service. So if you feel in any way manipulated by anything I say, you're off the hook. You don't have to give a single dime or dollar. You're, you get a get-out-of-jail-free card today, okay? All right, so this is the idea. Our purpose can't be discovered in what we purchase. It can be discovered in what we give. And if we're going to make choices about obtaining things, there's some, some things to ask ourselves. First, learn to choose gratitude over guilt or greed. This is a phenomenal way to approach life. How many times, I, I, I won't put this on anybody, how many times did I want to buy something for my kids because their friends had stuff like this and I felt guilty? I was a bad parent. Like, nobody tells you how much guilt you will experience as a parent. That was an eye-opening experience. But guilt is not a great way to decide to buy things, and greed certainly isn't a great way to decide things, but gratitude could be, because gratitude has a way of just disintegrating pride. It accepts that grace has come into your life, and there's things you have you didn't earn or deserve. 
And that just alters your mindset in such a way that it gives you different options to exercise. And then we can choose to make memories over material things. Choose to make memories over material things. Your kids, your grandkids will never remember 20, 30, 40 years from now what TV you brought home. Oh, remember when he got that big 65-inch 4K? They won't. They won't. You probably won't. But they'll remember the times that you played with them. And they'll remember the time that you encouraged them. And they'll remember the times that you consoled them. And you can't buy any of that. So often we think, oh, if I just got this, my kids will be more excited. And don't get me wrong, they will be very excited. Give your kid their first smartphone, just watch. They almost dance in the middle of the air. And we feel so good as a parent. Yes, I got it right. But I wonder, don't get me wrong, it's, excitement is, is a wonderful thing to be able to impart to our children, but that's not the same thing as an investment in their lives. And sometimes we can get addicted to wanting to create that excitement in their lives. And in reality, what we're doing is we're training them to be a victim of the culture of more for the rest of their lives. The only time they really experience excitement is when they're getting something new and shiny. Just think back over the most significant moments in your own life. More stuff doesn't make them more valuable. So if I told you today, you've got one year left to live. One year left to live. How would you think about your stuff? There's some stuff we would give away. We'd want other people to have it. Rather than wait for us to be gone and somebody to fight over it. How important would it be, would that promotion at work be, or would you be looking for extra hours in the office or extra hours in another way? Just one more thing to consider. Learn to ask why before you buy. Will this really create additional time in my life so that I can do more important things with more important people? Or will this take time away from them? Will this help me have more energy so I can serve others or less? Will this acquisition bring beauty into my life? Is this purchase something that I hope will make me feel better? Is this purchase something I hope will make others see me as more valuable. So Jesus told the rich young ruler something he didn't want to hear. Jesus always could find the one thing that was the most important thing to any person, and it wasn't the same thing for everybody. And he just looked at this guy, and he, he highlights two words. Sell. Give. Maybe for some of us, our challenge is not that we have too little, but maybe we have a little too much. It's easier to keep less stuff clean and organized. Maybe some things could be sold, and maybe you could use some of that extra resource to exercise generosity. Less stuff, less money. That was not the response the rich, young ruler wanted, and he became very sad. And for most of my life, I didn't realize that this isn't a story about one rich, young ruler. It's a story about two rich, young rulers. And they're having a conversation with each other. The Bible reveals that Jesus, for eternity, has been God's son, and he had wealth beyond our imagining and power beyond anything we've ever witnessed. And he was eternal. Getting old was not an option for him. And he was presented with the option of giving it all up. And how did he react to that option? Was he sad? Nope. Hebrews 12 tells us that for the joy that was set before him, he was willing to endure the cross. He didn't see himself losing anything. He saw him gaining us. And that was more than enough for him. He would let go of anything else. If you ever doubt your value to God, remember that. The wisest, most loving, smartest, 
most powerful being in all the universe is willing to let go of everything else to get you. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, um, it's hard. In our culture, we, we're constantly reminded of someone who has more or better or newer. And we can get trapped. Um, I ask that you would help every single person in this room to not automatically assume guilt because of your blessing. We're grateful for what you've given. I also ask that you would protect our hearts from falling into the trap of greed because there'll never be enough once we start that lifestyle. And I ask that you would help us to be grateful today. You have blessed us so much. Your grace has flown into our lives through so many different ways that we can't even remember them all or add up their value in our own hearts and minds. But we are grateful. And you've given us moments with people that we love. Treasures of time where conversations mattered, where for a brief moment people understood that what was being shared was more than just just a financial transaction. There's so much more to life than that. Just keep reminding us of that because we forget. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.